Good evening. I trust you had a good afternoon. Whatever that meant for you. <laughs> oh. How many of you know someone who is a Mormon? Okay. Doesn't surprise me, you know. Uh, Mormonism is probably the fastest growing uh, cult in the country, in the world, maybe. Uh, what do you, what do you, what do you, when, I, when, I, when we talk about somebody being a Mormon, what, what, tell me what you know about Mormons. What, what do you know about them? What's, what sticks out to you about them? And I'm not just talking about theologically or, or spiritually or whatever. What speaks out to you about them? Okay, they, they send their youngins on mission trip. Sandra? Okay, they value family. John, you said something? Yeah. Very evangelistic. Uh, they don't really have a choice, you know, when it comes down to that. Uh, Mormons usually are very uh, friendly. They're very considerate. They're very polite. Uh, they're very dependable. Uh, you know, uh, they, they have a tremendous amount of, of qualities. They're very involved in church work uh, from there. The uh, Mormons, as when they look to, at us as Christians, and of course Mormons consider themselves to be Christian. Uh, we're going to talk about why that's not so tonight. But uh, they see themselves as Christians. They see us not as, uh, not as lost, they see us as deceived. Uh, they see us as that uh, uh, we have just not heard the truth or refused to hear the truth or refused to listen to the truth. Uh, but I, I was talking before the service tonight, this in some way is a little bit more difficult uh, to go through and try to give you what you need without uh, making it feel like you're trying to drink out of a fire hose because there's so much information and so much history involved in the Mormon church uh, that I would tell you that the average Mormon does not have a clue about the history of the church, how it was formed, all the things that have taken place in the process uh, from there. Let me, let me just tell you that there's some things that uh, just the basic tenets of the Mormon belief, and then I want to talk just a little bit about their founding and all this sort of stuff. It, 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 the, the, val the basic belief structure about the important things that we're going to talk about of the Mormon is they believe the Bible is the Word of God insofar as it's correctly translated. Uh, Mormons basically have four books that they put a lot of credence in. Uh, they have the Bible. They use the Bible. Only the King James Version. To them, that's the only authorized version of the Bible is the King James Version. And then they had these books, which actually this is three books, is what this is here. They had the Book of Mormon, and then they have Doctrine and Covenants, and the Pearl of Great Price. The Book of Mormon is supposed to be the history of the Jewish people and how they wound up being here in the United States uh, over a period of time, along with a whole bunch of other stuff about the history of Joseph Smith and all sorts of things of that nature. These are the, this is the book that he translated that we'll talk about later on. Uh, the Doctrine and Covenants are, through the years, the leaders of the Mormon church get revelations. Uh, revelations sometimes that change previous beliefs or either espouse new beliefs, and those are recorded in Doctrine and Covenants. And Pearls of, uh, of Great Price is a compilation of... Uh, messages and statements and writings of the leaders of the church. Uh, so they believe that these, these actual four books, they are, have equal power, equal authority as far as they're concerned. Uh, it's called, the, it's, it's two books in one. It's The Doctrine and Covenants and Pearl of Great Price. Uh, there's actually been a revised version of the Book of Mormon that came out some I think it's 30 years ago, uh, 
that's called a New Testament of Jesus Christ uh, and through there. But some of the basic belief structures is that they, 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 they've put the same amount of uh, credence in those. Uh, Mormons are polytheistic. Now, you know what polytheistic means. Uh, if you don't, it means that they believe in more than one God. Uh, they will deny that. But we'll see in looking at their history and things that they say that that's not true, that they are polytheistic. Uh, they believe <laughs> that Earth is one of several inhabited planets. And each planet is ruled by gods and goddesses uh, from there. Uh, they do not believe in the Trinity in the same sense that we do. Uh, they did not believe in three essences as one being. Uh, they believe that there are three different gods that were born in different times and different places. Uh, the Father begot the Son and the Holy Ghost. In other words, that God the Father is the Father literally of Jesus. The Holy Ghost is not a person. The Holy Ghost is an essence, or uh, not even a, a spirit. It is an essence, you know, uh, that is that is present. Uh, they believe that humans, we as humans, are of the same species of God. Uh, we'll talk about later about how they believe that we can become God, you know, from there. Uh, to them, salvation is simply resurrection. Uh, but it, the exalt, exaltation to Godhead for eternal life must be earned from there. Uh, but we cannot take them, light, take them lightly because as of 200, uh, 2018, there were 16.2 million members of the Church of Jesus Christ of the Latter-day Saints. They have over 67,000 active missionaries. Uh, tithing is required. It's not an option as far as the church members are concerned. Uh, if they're going to be good, good believers, they must tithe. The Mormon church is an empire. Uh, they own bunches of stuff. Uh, they have companies. Uh, they have insurance companies. Uh, they have business corporations. Uh, they have members who are the founders of major corporations such as Marriott, uh, Pepsi. Uh, I always used to tell, that's why I don't drink Pepsi, you know. Uh, but it's, you know, it's, they don't own it, but they have major influence upon it in some ways. Uh, they take in about $33 billion a year in tithes. And they take in another $15 billion in business holdings. Uh, most of this stuff they refuse to divulge the information about. Uh, but it's there. And it can be looked up and it can be proved. Those are just, those are just some, some of the belief structures that they have uh, from there. Uh, the, the Mormon church is, is uh, divided into wards and stakes. Uh, a stake, which is the smallest division of them, is somewhere between 150 and 500 members. Your local Mormon church is a stake or a part of a stake. Uh, then they, excuse me, a ward. And then a stake is, is a larger conglomeration like we would call an association that has to have a member of 3,000, a minimum of 3,000 members uh, in that part of the stake from there. They have a, an extensive uh, organization structure uh, the current president, or the general authorities, they call him as Russell Nelson. He has two counselors that work with him. Beneath him is a council of 12, which are the apostles. And beneath that is the first quorum of 70, the second quorum of 70. And then they have a providing, uh, presiding Bishop Fasik, which these different people are assigned to overlook stakes and wards and things of that nature. Uh, it has been expanding over the years as their ministry and, and, and all has gone uh, on through time. But all this comes back to one man, one man, Joseph Smith. Joseph Smith was born in 1805, sons of mother and father and 10 brothers and sisters. His father was a person who liked to dig in the ground looking for treasure. Uh, he, uh, they said if you could look at their household where they grew up up in uh, Vermont at the time, it looked like it had been excavated. 
uh, because they were digging. Uh, Joseph also participated with him in that. His mother was a spiritualist. Uh, she was really involved in superstitions and things of that nature and going through the process. So he had kind of a background in there. Uh, he became confused about which church he needed to go to. His mother was a Presbyterian uh, from there. And he, with so many churches, he wasn't sure which church to go to. So he believed that he should pray to God and, and, and God would tell him which one to go. So he went out into the woods and decided to uh, uh, search and see just exactly what uh, he should believe from there. And uh, in 1820, he had a vision. Uh, in that vision, he was visited by God and Jesus. Uh, and and the, he has an account of that vision that is, that is uh, uh, in, in his history in here. He said he'd gone to the woods, he'd gone to a place where he'd been before, and he kneeled down and began to offer up his prayers to God. And he says, immediately I was seized upon by some power which entirely overcame me and had such an astounding influence over me as to bind my tongue so that I could not speak. Thick darkness gathered around me and it seemed for me, to me for a time as if I were doomed to sudden destruction. But exerting all my powers to call upon God to deliver me out of the power of this enemy which had seized upon me and at the very moment when I was ready to sink into despair and abandon myself to destruction, not to an imaginary ruin, but to the power of some actual being from the unseen world who had such marvelous power as I had never felt before in any being. Just at this moment of great alarm, I saw a pillar of light exactly over my head above the brightness of the sun, which descended gradually until it fell upon me. It no longer appeared then I found myself delivered from the enemy which held me bound. And when the light rested upon me, I saw two personages whose brightness and glory defy all description standing above me in the air. And one of them spake unto me, calling me by name and saying, pointing to the other, this is my beloved son, hear him from there. So he was visited by God and Jesus at the same time who proceeded to tell him that all churches were bad, that the church had uh, collapsed, had become apostate uh, early on, and there was no real church. And he was to reestablish uh, the church. He was to rebuild the church in the way that God wanted it to be rebuilt. And so, and he told him that he would receive more visions and more uh, 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 visits uh, that would give him further information about how to do this. So in 1823, three years later, uh, he was visited by a, an angel who uh, depending on which of his writings you read, the angel's name was either Moroni or Nephi. Uh, it's always been a, a, a bone of contention among the people because one time he called him Moroni, one time he called him Nephi. Uh, Moroni told him that there would be, uh, in order for him to do what he was wanting to do, he would be given the gift of a set of golden plates uh, and upon them were uh, writings that he was to, dis to uh, decipher and write them out. Uh, he would be given uh, two stones that would help him do that. Uh, these are referred to as the Urim and the Thummim. Uh, uh, those are also mentioned in Scripture. You know, and they were used uh, in decision making. But he told him that he was where it was going to be. Uh, it was going to be. Uh, on a hill, uh, Camorra, in uh, Palmyra, New York. But he was not to go there until he was told to go there. So in 1827, uh, he was told to go there, which is interesting because after what God had told him about 1825, he rejoined the Presbyterian Church, even though it was, he was told that it was apostate. Uh, but in 1827, he went and dug up those golden plates and... Uh, uh, it also incl in included the Urim and the Thummim. And through that process, he began to translate uh, those stones into what is the Book of Mormon. Uh, which is interesting because the, well, supposedly what was on the gold uh, tablets was Reformed Egyptian hieroglyphics. 
uh, which no one would be able to read, uh, but only he could. Uh, it's also interesting that he enlisted the help of some other people in, trans, uh, in transcribing what he was reading, uh, a fellow by the name of Crowdery, uh, and a couple of others were used in that process, and they had stated that it seemed like most of the time he was not reading uh, what was on the uh, tablets itself, that he was just putting the stones into his hat and would sit there and stare at the stones and translate the stones, the tablets, without even looking at them uh, from there. In 1829, he had another vision where he was visited by John the Baptist, who was sent by Peter, James, and John to confer the Aaronic priesthood upon him and, and Cowdery uh, because of what they had done. In 1830, the Book of Mormon was published. 1838, uh, the Mormon church was established uh, shortly before there. But during this process, they moved to Missouri. Uh, they kept getting run out of wherever they were. Uh, the people that lived there, you know, were great odds with them. <clears throat> this is part of the reason that even today Mormons think that they're highly persecuted by everyone uh, because of their belief structures. But they left uh, New York uh, and went to Missouri. In Missouri, uh, there was a, uh, an, an incident with uh, uh, some people involved in there, and they... they uh, uh, waged what was called the, the Mormon War or encouraged them to wage the Mormon War and tried to eliminate all their detractors, uh, which ultimately left them uh, uh, as persona non grata as far as the people that lived there were concerned, and they had to move on ultimately to Ohio, uh, where the first stake was established. Uh, at the same time, this was in 18, mid, mid 18 uh, or late 1830s. Uh, one of the first revelations that came through established the practice of polygamy uh, because they believed that G God was a polygamist also. Uh, between the years of 1831 and 1844, there were 135 revelations that Joseph Smith had uh, that he began to compile. Uh, in 1890, uh, Wilford Woodruff, who was one of the prophets of the church, had a revelation that said... Uh, Polygamy is no longer an accepted practice. Uh, that actually was uh, because the government was going to tell them they would never recognize them as a state if they had the practice of polygamy as part of their, their grounding. Uh, after Ohio, they went to Nauvoo, Illinois, uh, which is where he also believes the Garden of Eden was. But uh, the, the local newspaper... Uh, the Navu expositor uh, began to expose him uh, and went back and, re and started printing things about things that he had done. He was what they called a peep stoner. Uh, you know, he would use, a, even, even with his father, when his father was digging holes and he would help them, he had a stone and he'd put that stone in his hat, you know, and then he'd sit there and he'd stare at the stone and it would tell him exactly where to dig. Uh, they never found anything, you know, but it would tell him exactly where to dig. Uh, the Navajo expositor began to uh, uh, expose him, and he began a war against the Navajo expositor, and ultimately uh, was one of the times he was arrested uh, for rioting, creating a riot and treason. And they put him in jail in Carthage, Illinois. And on June 27th of 1844, uh, a crowd of people attacked the jail and drug him and one other man out and uh, murdered them. Uh, that's why a lot of people think that he's now was a martyr because of that, but history will prove that's wrong because a martyr is someone who gives himself up for the sake of another. Uh, uh, Joseph Smith went down with a gun in his hand after killing two of the people that were coming into the jail. And it was a, they say it was an old Western type gunfight uh, that took place uh, from there. He was succeeded by Brigham Young uh, a name you're probably very familiar with, and he's proceeded to lead uh, the Mormon people on a pilgrimage which led them to Utah. Uh, and they began to establish themselves out there. Their ways didn't change a whole lot because they were not a popular people to begin with in Utah when they were not as powerful as they are at this point in time. But there was always something that was called the Mountain Meadows Massacre that happened in 1857. There was a wagon train of immigrants coming into the state of Utah, 
and they were attacked by a band of Mormons and 120 men, women, and children were murdered uh, from there. The Mormon church kind of glosses that over because they don't really know that they know exactly what happened. Uh, there are some that believe that Brigham Young was the person who instigated that to take place, uh, but the church denies that you know, completely from there. Uh, so there's, there's a very interesting history behind the Mormon church and all that took place. It, I believe it's helpful to understand uh, the kind of person that was involved in the founding uh, of the Mormon church. Uh, there have been a lot of changes that have taken place over the years. There have been splits. I think there's some 16 different splits off from the Mormon church. The, uh, the largest split was what it was originally called the RLDS. You know, most, of, most Mormons refer to themselves as LDS. They don't really like the term Mormon uh, from there. But the RDLS was a Reformed uh, Latter-day Saints, uh, which has now been changed to Community Christ Church, which is, uh, I think it's in Peoria, Illinois. The Book of Mormon is supposedly a history, a history of the two groups of Jewish people uh, who came to the United States. The first was the Jaredites. Uh, the Jaredites left the Tower of Babel about 2250 B.C., and they immigrated to the Western Hemisphere. Uh, they were ultimately, that was in South America, ultimately they were destroyed by corruption uh, amongst themselves. The second group were, were righteous Jews. 600 uh, years before the destruction of Jerusalem and Babylonian captivity, they crossed the Pacific to South America. Uh, they developed into two tribes, the Lehi's and the Nephites, which became, or the Lehi's divided into two tribes, the Nephites and the Lamanites, which were warring groups. Uh, the Nephites were supposedly the good guys. The Lamanites were not so necessarily the good guys. Uh, and ultimately, the Nephites, or Lamanites, killed all the Nephites. Now, for years and years and years, uh, black people were not allowed uh, into the temple or to become a part of the uh, Mormon faith. And that was based upon uh, statements in Scripture that came through Ah, my tag fell off from there. But according to the, the Book of Mormon, the, the Lamanites were condemned because of their wickedness, and so they were struck with dark skin. Uh, and ultimately, the Lamanites were to become the American Indian. Uh, that's how they got here, and that's why Indians were here when everybody else came over. Uh, uh, people who study g genetics and archaeology and can trace people from generation to generation, all that said, there is no way that the American Indian could have come from the East because they don't have the same bone structure, they don't have the same DNA, they don't same, have all the things that would tie them genetically to there. You know, so they they are they are more mongoloid. Uh, than people realize they are. Uh, trying to figure out just exactly where I'm giving you too much information. Because uh, I don't want you to go to sleep during the middle of the, uh, <laughs> of the story. But I tell you all that to know that there is a sordid history uh, as in the foundation of the Mormon church. The critical thing for you to know is that the average Mormon does not know. They have never studied it. And when they are presented with the factual issues about that, usually they're appalled at what's going on from there. Uh, I can say with, you know, I guess great satisfaction or joy or whatever you want to call it, that uh, black people can now be saved in the Mormon church. Uh, that was in 1978 is when they, they had another revelation that said, well, that's, they're okay, you know, uh, from there. 
See, the Book of Mormon and everything that comes before it can be changed because the leaders of the Mormon church are considered prophets. They're considered prophets. And so what they say carries the word of God, you know, as a revelation directly from God. And so people accept it and go on from that point. Uh, but the, the leaders of the Mormon church uh, have slowed down in the last year as far as, or last years as far as their revelations. There haven't been that many uh, in, in the last years and going through that process. But they put a tremendous amount of influence upon the Book of Mormon as far as its, its writings and things of that nature. Uh, and, and that it being the absolutely uh, uh, divine word of God, I guess is the correct way to put it. But let's go back to what they actually believe, you know, from that standpoint. Uh, they're polytheistic, you know, which means they worship more than one God. Uh, the, uh, the Mormon God is different than our God. Uh, let me read you an, an excerpt in here. This is, this is, these are some things that were taken from uh, the Journal of Discourses and books that have been written by Mormon leaders over the years. There's several statements here. One of them says, In the beginning, the head of the gods called the Council of the Gods, and they came together and concocted a plan to create the world and people in it. Those are the words of Joseph Smith. God himself was once as we are now and is an exalted man. See, their belief was that God began just like a human man. And by going through the things he was supposed to go through, you know, as a good Mormon, he was able to go to uh, exalted status, which occurs in the celestial heaven. Mormons believe that in, in universal, uh, universal salvation, in a sense, you know, that when, uh, in, in their mindset, every person that exists was a spirit created by God, that we all existed and God then chose them to go to a planet or to an earth, you know, and they would begin the process of becoming gods, which means uh, that they would do the things the Mormon church told them to do. They would be good, for lack of a better term, good Mormons, you know, and live that kind of life that ultimately would allow them you know, to obtain Godhead. You know, from there, uh, Richard Kim. Uh, I want to say Richard Kimball. <laughs> That's from the what's that movie? <laughs> the Fugitive. You know, the Fugitive <laughs> from there. But the fellow by the name of Kimball was a president one time, and he made this statement. He says, "What man is, God has been. What God is, man seeks to become." You know, from there, uh, Brigham Young said, "Jesus Christ was not begotten by the Holy Ghost." Uh, they believed that God had a wife. You know, this is how these spirit beings were created, is that God had a wife. In other words, uh, Bjorn Young also said, God could not have had a son if he didn't have a wife. You know, it's incredible that he could have a son with not having a wife, you know, from there. Uh, it says, the Father has a body of flesh and bones as tangible as man's, the Son also, but the Holy Ghost has not a body of flesh and bones, but is a personage of experience, of a spirit. Whereas the Bible tells us that God is spirit, you know, he does not have a body of flesh and bones. He's spirit. Gods exist, and we had better strive to be prepared to be one with them. Each of these gods, including Jesus Christ and his Father, being in possession of not merely an organized spirit, but a glorious immortal body of flesh and bones. You know, and it says, as far as in Abraham 4.1, it says, Then the Lord said, Let us go down. And they went down at the beginning, and they, they that is the gods, organized and formed the heavens, and the earth. Remember that God, our Heavenly Father, was perhaps once a child and mortal like we ourselves and rose step by step in the scale of progress in the school of advancement, has moved forward and overcome until he has arrived the point where he is now. See, the question that I have when I, when I hear them say that sort of thing is, you know, that if God was, was a man to begin with, where did he come from? You know, where did he come from? How was he created? Where did he come from? 
Is he just a child of some of the other gods? You know, from that standpoint. So they believe, you know, Scripture tells us over and over again that God is one God. There is no other before him. There never has been. There never will be. You know, but they see it as it being unreasonable. Same thing as the, the Jehovah Witnesses. Unreasonable. And when it's unreasonable, then they cannot fathom it. You know, going through that process. The real difference between Jehovah Witnesses and Mormons is where is the Jehovah Witness, and I don't mean this derogatorily, but the Jehovah Witness is primarily a, a religion of the uneducated. But Mormonism really has a high standard for education. You know, they, they, they have their own college, you know, Brigham Young University, you know, BYU. Sometimes has a decent football team, you know, from there. Uh, they have secondary schools. They have training centers. You know, from that standpoint, uh, everything that, that uh, you know, they can provide for somebody to develop uh, an, an education, uh, it is, it is a, a, a religion for those that are intelligent from there. They believe that every male uh, Mormon is a member of one or two uh, of, the, of the two priesthoods, the Aaronic or the Melchizedek priesthood. Uh, every young man by the age of 12 becomes a member of the Aaronic priesthood. And if he is a really, really good Mormon, he is elevated to the Melchizedek priesthood. And it can be passed down from generation to generation, which is in total conflict with what the scripture tells us uh, in Hebrews about the, the, the Melchizedek priesthood. Uh, Scripture tells us that there is only one uh, of the Melchizedek priesthood now, and that is Jesus Christ. In, Mel, uh, in chapter 7, uh, verse 7 through 10, it says, And without a doubt that lesser is blessed by the greater, in the one case, <laughs> wrong chapter, that's... <laughs> It said, if perfection could have been attained through the Levitical priesthood, and indeed the law given to the people established that priesthood, why was there still a need for another priest to come, one in the order of Melchizedek? You know, it goes on and says, talking of Jesus, it says, you are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. And it goes on and, and talks about how the fact that there is no need for any other and there is no one else that will follow him in that order from there. But they believe that that's, uh, is, is necessary in their relationship in order to begin their Godhead process. Everything in their life is moving them towards uh, Godhead. You know, they believe that and going through that process. Uh, as I said, the Holy Spirit is viewed as being the light of Christ, not a, not a real thing, but a, a spirit being in, in, in sort of sense. Uh, when you talk about Jesus, uh, they believe that... Uh, uh, he was, they'll say that he was not conceived by the Holy Spirit. Uh, he was conceived because God and Mary got together and he impregnated her uh, with Jesus' spirit body in order that he might become a man. Uh, it's interesting that coincides with Greek mythology where the gods came down and had sex and produced babies with human beings, you know, from there. Uh, for them, salvation... Is not based on grace. Uh, it, 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 is, it includes grace, but it must include baptism, obedience, good works. Thus, that's why the missionary zeal, they are working their way into heaven, you know, as far as it's concerned. They, they, they're doing what they need to do in order to retrieve uh, Godhead. Uh, they say that uh, there's no such thing as a last minute salvation. Uh, you know, when, when Jesus said to the thief on the cross today, you will be with me in paradise, they interpret that paradise to be a spirit prison where all the people that are dead go to hear Mormon gospel preached, you know, so that they might become good Mormons, you know, from there. They also believe in the book of Moses that Cain was the first father of the Negro race. And he was punished for, for, uh, for his crimes. And because of that, until 1978, the, the Negroes were not allowed, uh, uh, allowed entrance into the temple. As far as the Savior is concerned, they say Jesus was the spirit brother of Lucifer. He was married to Mary, Mary, uh, Mary Martha, and the other Mary uh, because he was a polygamist. 
Uh, but the real issue is to them, the cross is not sufficient for all sins. They do not believe that the cross is sufficient for all sins, but man's blood can be. In other words, if a person was a really bad person, the, 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 the price Jesus paid on the cross is not enough to save him. But if that person is willing to shed his own blood, then he can gain remission for his sins by doing that. So the human's blood is, is more powerful than the blood of Jesus when it comes right down to it for, for some sins. Uh, salvation includes grace and human effort. Uh, they believe that salvation in itself, you know, the, what is the scriptural? Where did I write it down? That's a good question. When, when uh, John 1, 12, somebody got a Bible with them? Somebody got a, look at John 1, 12. That's why I can't find it because I didn't write it down. John 1, 12. Yeah, John 1, 12. That was the right verse. Mm -hmm. Tell him to keep his hands to himself back there. <laughs> okay. In the Mormon scriptures, in the Book of Mormon, it reads this way. But as many as received him, to them he gave the power to continue to be the sons of God. Because they believed they didn't need to become the sons of God. They were already the sons of God. They were begotten by God, so they were the sons of God. So why would they need to become? They would just be able to continue being the sons of God by doing what they're supposed to do. Mormons believe in three heavens. Actually, there's three heavens and the third heaven has multiple divisions in it. Uh, the first one is the celestial heaven. And remember, I, I told you that Mormons believe in universal salvation. They do not believe in hell. They do not believe in eternal damnation except for a select few. Uh, the celestial heaven is the first level. Most adults, even sinners, those who were not Christians, those who do not believe, they will go to that celestial and that's where they'll live for eternity. The second level is called the terrestrial. I, to me, it seems like those are reversed as far as the tiles, but they're not. Terrestrial is made up of Christians who did not accept Mormon theology. It's made up of Mormons who did not live up to their church commitments and other religious people around the world. Uh, and then there is the celestial. The celestial is the path to Godhead. Uh, only super Mormons get to go to the celestial heaven. Only people who have been perfect in their life and their relationship to the church and their faithfulness to the rules and the regulations and the uh, uh, obedience to the edicts passing down and all that, only those can make it into the celestial. And the celestial heaven actually has multiple levels to it as a person ascends unto Godhead, you know, as he becomes more like God. And once you get to the top of the celestial heaven, you are a God. And as a grand prize for your godhood, you get to rule and you get the presence of your own planet in order for you to go and establish your own kingdom as far as that is concerned. I know you want to sit there and shake your heads at it. Uh, and you wonder how people could believe this. Uh, in addition to all sorts of other things. You know, a person who is not a good Mormon is not allowed into the, the temples. Uh, you cannot attend the temples unless you are in good standing as a Mormon. Uh, we could talk about things like good Mormons, you know, wear special underwear, uh, you know, as part of their, uh, a part of their uh, faithful service. Uh, we could talk about baptism for the dead, where they believe since people, everybody's involved and everybody's going to be saved, they can go and pray 
and intercede for their relatives in order to get them into the second level of heaven. You know, from that standpoint, uh, you can go and be baptized for the dead. Uh, there are all sorts of, of rituals, I'll use that term, and things that they go through within the church. Us Gentiles would never be allowed inside a Mormon temple except one day. When a Mormon temple is rebuilt, when it's, when it's brand spanking new, they have an open house. And anybody can go in on that day and go through most of the temple as far as that's concerned. And my professor in seminary would make it a point that every time they opened up a new temple, he would be there on that day uh, so that he could go in there. Uh, I guess the real thing that we need to deal with as Christians is how do we deal with Mormons? How do we witness to Mormons. Uh, first of all, you really need to understand the missionaries. Uh, most of the missionaries are young men uh, between the ages of 18 and 24. Uh, we seem to think that they are super smart. They have been through all sorts of teaching and all that sort of stuff. But really, they've only been taught what they need to know. Uh, they understand our scriptures and what the Bible says better than most Christians do. Uh, most Christians, I believe, are woefully unprepared to engage into a conversation with Mormon missionaries uh, because you have to be on your, your, your terms. Uh, much as with it was with the Jehovah Witness or with any cult, if you're going to talk with them, the first thing you need to do is you need to define terms. You need to define terms. Because Mormons will throw out the words, you know, they'll throw out God and Jesus and Elohim and, and the Holy Spirit and, and things of that nature. They'll throw them out there, but you need to get them to define just exactly who that is. You know, to them, who, who is God? Who is Jesus? Who is the Holy Spirit? You know, what, what does salvation mean? You know, uh, you need to make sure, get them to say what it is, you know, from that standpoint. And they're going to be willing to tell you. But you have to be prepared to respond to them in what the Bible says, you know, from there. Uh, you need to be focused on eliminating misconceptions. Mormons don't believe in hell or eternal punishment. They believe what basically hell is, is it means that your progress towards Godhead has been stopped. You know, you've reached the point that you can't go any further. Uh, they believe that we, as, as average Christians, we are ignorant or deceived. And they see us as needing to hear what they've got us to say. And part of that process of talking with one is to help them understand that we do know our Bible and we do know what it says. Uh, and we use it in defense of our faith. We need to say, uh, what's your authority? You know, what is your authority? <laughs> Where in the Bible does it say that any of the apostles held either the Aaronic or Melchizedek priesthood? It doesn't. You know, it talks about how we are priests. You know, there's a kingdom of priests of us as children of God. We are priests and our job is to share the good news. We need to present our priesthood. We need to present to them, what is our revelation? Where do we get our revelation from? We get it from God's word. You know, and who is our prophet? Our prophet is Jesus Christ. You know, no one else but Jesus Christ. And you have to be willing to take control of the, of the discussion. In other words, you need to lead the discussion. Do not let them lead the discussion because they're going to take you down paths that are unnecessary. They're going to get caught on things that are not important. You know, you need to realize you're the teacher. And you have the Holy Spirit guiding you. And you have the authority of Jesus Christ in order to help you share with them what they need to hear. Uh, Mormons have no idea about salvation by grace. And that they don't have to earn it. That it's a free gift from God. And, and, and you need to learn to use scriptures that talk about that. The book of Galatians talks about that. There are multiple, and I can share some other ones with you, that talk about how our, our freedom, our salvation comes through the grace of God, not through anything that we do. It speaks to the, the, you know, the only work that we can do for our salvation is to say, yes, I am a sinner. And I want you to be my Savior. <laughs> Begin with prayer before you even start. 
and be the one that prays. You know, and in that prayer, you know, we're, I'm, I'm, we're taught as pastors that when we pray, we're not supposed to pray for a purpose. You know, preach to people through a prayer. But in this case, it's okay to preach to people through prayer. You know, we can evoke the presence of God. We can we can we can talk about what the Bible tells us and thank God for our salvation that comes through Him. We can we can plant the seeds right then through that process. But remember. For the Mormon missionary, his knowledge is based on feelings. It's based on feelings. What that person believes. And it's because of what he's been taught. And it's an emotional issue for him. So step one is do not hurt their feelings. Do not belittle them. Do not be angry with them. You know, do not do, do not be don't look down on them. See them as they are, a child of God in need of salvation. Guide the, conver guide the conversation by you bringing up the topics. Keep it on the important things, the Scripture, the authority of Scripture, who God is, who Christ is, what is salvation. You know, Talk to them about language and context. Uh, you know, a lot of, of, there are so many... Uh, there are hundreds and thousands in the Book of Mormon that are directly plagiarized from the King James Version of the New Testament. I could show you one of these books here. It's got about 10 pages of direct statements that are taken from the King James and entered into uh, the Book of Mormon uh, from there. It is plagiarized directly. And then a lot of things are taken out of context. You need to talk about how important context is. And we know that as we study the Bible. I mean, I've always believed that I can prove anything scripturally if you allow me to proof text. You allow me to take things out of, of context and use them any way I want to. I can say it. The Bible says I can, you know, or I should, or I will. But you have to take things into context. And you also have to understand language, you know, and as it goes through. You know, they talk, one of the reasons they think God has a... Has a, a uh, a body is because, you know, it talks to, in the Bible that Moses spoke to him face to face. And it refers to him, you know, that, that God has, you know, hands, you know, and, and, and all this sort of stuff. What you need to have point to him, and don't ask me where it is right now, but there's also a scripture in the Old Testament that describes God as having wings and feathers, you know, from there. Those are examples. Those are, those are characteristics from there. But they take them as literal, you know, from there, from that standpoint. And of course, the argument always is <clears throat> that your Bible is your Bible is filled with inconsistencies. You look at things in the Bible and there are conflicts, you know, inconsistencies in what the Scripture says. But you can point out to them, well, the Book of Mormon since nineteen or since eighteen thirty has had over four thousand changes, and not all of those were just vocabulary. They were wherever they went back in and changed what was said and altered it to fit what their present belief structure is and all that sort of thing, you know, from there. It's a challenge. <clears throat> so what, what do you really, what should you really know before they come knock on your door? They believe that, more, that total apostasy overtook the church uh, following the apostolic times and that the Mormon church is the restored church. But if the Mormon church is truly a restored church, you would expect to find first century historical evidence for Mormon doctrines like the plurality of gods or, or God the Father having been once a man, but there's no such thing from there at all. Besides, the Bible teaches against the total apostasy of the church in Matthew. He warns against a partial apostasy, you know, from there. Mormons claim that God the Father was once a man and he progressed to godhood. Now that he is exalted a mortal man with a flesh and own body, but the Bible tells us God has never been a man, has not, and has never been. He is a spirit. He is a spirit and creator of all that is. He's also eternal and unchangeable, unchangeable, you know, from there. And when they talk about believing in three persons, you know, not three persons in one God, but one God, but three distinct gods. But the Bible tells us in Exodus 20 that worshiping more than one God is condemned. You know, from there. They believe that we can go through a process to become gods. But the Bible teaches us that even wanting to be God-like is what led to the fall of mankind in the first place. 
wanting to attain to God. And God doesn't look kindly on humans that want to attain deity. They believe in three kingdoms. We talked about those. They believe that when Adam sinned, and one, one of the, I believe it was Brigham Young, taught that Adam, God was actually Adam. You know, they had what was called the God-Adam theory. Uh, the church has since disavowed that. But he believed that God actually came in human form as Adam. And Adam sinned. His transgression uh, was a noble act because through his sin, it made it possible for us uh, to become mortal and to begin the path to Godhood, to exaltation. There's a, you can read about Mormons, you can read and study, and you keep unturning, overturning rocks all the way through the deal. You know. Uh, but suffice it to say that Mormons are good people, by and large. They're just like anybody else. There's probably some bad ones out there too. I believe though that the average Mormon has no idea what he really believes. I believe he is only going through the motions of what he's been told he's supposed to do in order to attain Godhead. I personally don't believe that most Mormons even believe in that theory of becoming gods. You know, I, I believe that in the world we live in today, that is something that is beyond human reason and everything people think about now is something they got to be able to understand. But they've been indoctrinated into it. They are lost. They need a savior. And they need to hear about grace and mercy and the gift of salvation through Jesus Christ. And most of them have never heard that. They haven't read it in the scripture. Because a lot more credence is put upon what the Book of Mormon says, what the Doctrine and Covenants and Pearl of the Great Price says, rather than what the, the Scripture says, even the King James Version of the Bible that they so strongly ascribe to from there. Uh, it's a challenge. Most people are afraid because they feel like they don't know enough. They don't feel like they're prepared. There's only one answer to that. That's get prepared, you know. Study the scriptures that have to deal with those particularly four most important things. Who God is, who Jesus is, what salvation is, what the Bible is. You know, if you, if you study those and learn those and commit them to your memory and your thoughts, then it, uh, it puts you in a place where you are better prepared to share the gospel with anyone, but even someone as such as a, a member of the, the Latter-day Saints. Now, any questions that popped into your mind? Any comments that popped into your mind? <clears throat> Right. They are actually using the King James Bible. Mm -hmm. So how do they rationalize the contradictions between there? Is the Book of Mormon just an extension on the, the prophet that was Jesus as they believe him? That's a good question as to how do they how do they rationalize and, and, and resolve the contradictions? Because there's so many. I think mainly I would have to say that most people don't know that there's contradictions. You know, because they are taught uh, uh, to, to depend upon the prophets and what the prophet says is goes. There are some, there are some contradictions that, that would be hard for anybody uh, to rationalize. <clears throat> oh, rats. I've got a book that lists, I didn't bring it with me, a book that lists some of the contradictions in, in the Mormon Bible, you know, in, in the Book of Mormon and going through that process. And some of them are sitting there saying, scratch your head. And you say, how, how, do, how do they believe that, you know, going through that process? But they have been so indoctrinated through the teachings and leaderships of the different stakes and wards. And, it's, and part of their being good Mormons is they accept what they're taught. 
You know, because it is, if it comes from a prophet, it's the word of God. And if that prophet says what the King James Bible said over there is, let me interpret it for you. Because remember that statement at the very beginning, in as much as it's correctly interpreted, you know, from there. So I think that's how it happens, Damon. Any, uh, any other questions? So there's a lot of good reasons not to be a Mormon or believe in their, in their, um, in, in their beliefs, but are you familiar with um, the book of Abraham? I think it's in the Pearl of Great Tribe. Mm-hmm. The problem with the book of Abraham. Mm-hmm. So, for, you know, uh, some guy, some guy brought, uh, bought or uh, brought uh, like a Egyptian papyrus. Um, it was in, I believe, Ohio. And uh, they got Joseph Smith to interpret it. And uh, essentially what happened was is that piece of that papyrus got lost. Mm-hmm. Um, they thought that it burned in a fire. It was later found in the Smithsonian, And they compared what he wrote in the book, of, you know, the book of Abraham to what it said. And he wasn't like this at all. Yeah. So I didn't get one. There was actually, they brought in an, an expert uh, to... Uh, verify his interpretation of it and according to Joseph Smith the expert said that his his uh, uh, translation was correct uh, but later on the expert came out and sp- spoken and what he said was the translation is a hoax he says it's not even close to what's being said you know from there uh, and so see you could read for days about stuff. Joseph Smith was arrested for uh, so many times in his early life. He was arrested for uh, 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 failing to pay back loans. He, he opened up his own little bank there for a while and he was making fraudulent loans. You know, uh, the man, uh, the, the people that lived around him wrote letters to the governments of their areas asking them to make them leave because they were polluting the entire uh, community and where they lived. Uh, they were undesirable and, 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 and people like that. Uh, that's what I mean when you say, you know, that the average, the average Mormon does not know about all this story. Hit her. How do they know a good Mormon from a bad Mormon? A good Mormon is one who strictly adheres uh, to Mormon doctrine and also practices and participates uh, in temple worship, he is, he's good enough to go to temple worship from there because he's done all the things he's supposed to do. He's tithed like he's supposed to. He's, he's uh, adhered to all the, the rituals and things that go on, you know, from there. The records. Remember, the Mormon church is really into genealogy, you know, and, and that's if, if, you're, if you start doing, you know, all these different things you can buy and Ancestry.com and all that sort of stuff, the Mormon church has the largest genealogical laboratory in the world. You know, from there, almost every research in genealogy comes back there at some point in time from there. But they have to be, if you're going to be married, uh, if you're a good Mormon, you got married in the temple. You know, you were received the baptism of the Holy Spirit that can only be given to you by the laying on of hands of one of the, the elders of the temple itself. Everything centers around that temple. And a person who is not a good Mormon can't even go into that temple. You know, even if they are a believer, but if they are not a practicing good Mormon, they can't go in that temple. You know, they can't participate in the baptism for the dead. You know, they can't do this, they can't do this, they can't do this. Because that temple is the center of everything. So and on, hmm? that those councils that we were talking about that oversee the stakes and, and wards and all that sort of stuff, somehow they keep records and all that. So yeah. They yeah. They can ask yeah, a, a good a good Mormon, I believe, does not have to have permission to go in. But I think each person has to it's kinda like, you know, I have to bring my passport you know, in order to be able to go into the... See, there's not a... When you're talking about a Mormon church, that's not a temple. There are only... I think there's 18 temples in the world right now. There's one in Atlanta. There's the one in Salt Lake City, of course. Uh, There's... I think there's five in the United States altogether uh, from there. Uh, They're very ornate, very expensive, very fancy cathedrals, you know, from there. Uh, if you, you know, so, uh, but it's a very special privilege. You have to go through all sorts of rigmaroles to be married in what they call celestial marriage, which is getting married inside the temple, 
you know, from there. You have to meet certain standards and things of that nature. <clears throat> Well, you go to the local church. See, that's not a temple. That's just a, that's a ward, you know, from there in most cases. Uh, it's just like, you know, I mentioned to you once before the friend of mine over in Madison that got involved in a long-term thing with Mormons. Well, when she got, got to a point that she was beginning to bother them, then the local ward sent to Tallahassee, which is where the stake center is, which is the, the, the bigger overseeing, like an association, then they sent people down, you know, to engage in the conversation, you know. But it didn't take long for them to her to terminate that from there. But if you are not, at one time, Mormon wives were served one purpose, and that was to produce spirit children that could go on to Godhead. You know, from that standpoint, uh, in the past, and and I can't, I'm not going to say this about the present, but in the past, women did not carry the same uh, level as men. You know, from there, you notice that everything we talked about the night never really talked about women. You know, from there, they serve that one purpose. Uh, there are some people that would say that even though Mormons are really family centered and, uh, and they focus on the family and they're cl uh, closely tight knit groups, uh, uh, there are some statistics in the past years that showed that Mormon, uh, that Utah, the state of Utah, which is almost entirely Mormon, uh, has one of the highest divorce rates of any state in the United States, and has and, yeah, and the and and it also has one that it it and I'm not sure when these statistics came out. I think they were about 15 to 18 years ago, but at that time it had one of the highest teenage suicide rates uh, in the nation. Not from there. Right. So what's amazing to me is people that were born and raised in a Baptist church and and do come from this church mm -hmm. that get transferred over in the I just can't put It is hard to understand how someone could leave, you know, like we're talking about uh I, I think the reason for that is, Stanley, is that there is one problem for the average Christian. You know, because we live in a world that, that wants to be able to understand everything. And the one thing that we cannot understand you know, or people struggle with is grace. When we talk about our salvation, you know, as I mentioned this morning, you know, our, our salvation through, through, through God is God's work. It's not ours. You know, the only thing we got to say was yes, you know, to his offer of salvation. People can't grasp the concept of grace. They feel like they have to. To earn it, you know, they have to have a part of it in order for it to have value. And through the things that you're required to do as part of the Mormon Church, you know, they can base. And I'll, I'll say this simplistically: they can give you a list of ten things that you can do in order to achieve Godhead. You know, and those are ten things that you, as a human being today, can do physically. Excuse me, not something that you have to depend upon the input of someone else or from God but it's something that you can accomplish. I think that's what attracts uh, Baptists, Methodists, Presbyterians, you know, because they feel like they have some control because everybody's about control in their lives. You know, you want to know that I have some, some doings in this, you know, from there. I can fix this, you know, and so they give you the, the key to doing it. I think that's what's behind that, Stanley, in my opinion, from there. Any other questions? Have I confused you? I hope not. <laughs> no. How do we, like, when we're talking about baptism with a woman and they get baptized and there's death baptism, how do we take our baptism and their baptism and compare them to make it seem like our baptism, I mean, our baptism is the right one, um, that there's only one way to get baptized and that's through Jesus Christ and have a relationship with them? How do we talk to them about that with not confusing well, it, I think we have to go to what the scripture says about baptism. You know, we do it in obedience. To them, baptism is part of the salvation process. Uh, it actually, one of the, the confusing things that's happened in the period is the order of, of repentance and baptism. You know, at one point in time, they were teaching that repentance came first, baptism came next. Then it was reversed, that baptism came first, and that produced repentance. You know, from there, but baptism is like those that believe that you have to, 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 to be baptized to be saved. 
To them, it is part of the salvation process. To us, baptism is a result of the salvation that takes place. You know, it is a testimony from our standpoint from there. And I think, you know, we, we do it in obedience to divine command, but it's never, the, the scripture tells us that salvation comes by grace and grace alone and faith in Christ, you know, through anything else that we do, you know, from that standpoint. But that comes in that process when we start talking about, you know, those, those four things that are important that we need to define and, and point out how that's going to work. You know, it's what, who God is, who Jesus is, you know, because once you begin to, to break down who God is, as far as they're concerned, then it's going to begin to domino effect with everything else, you know, and through that process. Anybody else? Any other questions? What's next week? Uh, well, next week is the uh, 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 tailgate party. <laughs> uh, but the next one we'll look at, we'll begin to look at uh, uh, Herbert W. Armstrong and the Worldwide Church of God. Uh, Worldwide Church of God. Most of you probably don't have never heard of that. Uh, it, uh, it still exists. Uh, it's under a different name and a different title now uh, from there as it's gone down through the ages. Uh, you'll hear ter uh, terms such as Anglo-Israelism uh, that has to deal with the uh, 12 tribes of Israel. You know, that uh, people seem to struggle about trying to figure out what happened with them. Uh, our position and relationship with God, what salvation is, what, you know, it all comes back to those very same things, you know, from there. Uh, and so we'll start looking at them week after next uh, from there along that line. Okay. If you come, if you have a thought through this process that, that you know, can we look at this group too, you know, or another group, you know, because we're going to talk a little bit about Islam you know, it gets right down, so we begin to understand a little bit about that, uh, and probably in conjunction with that, some of the Eastern religions. You know, we don't see much of them around here in this place, but they are they are here, and so you know, we need to be prepared and have some sort of idea how uh, that we can share our faith with them when we go through uh, from there. But if you think of one, you know, give me a call, and if during the week after we've talked about this, you come up with a question or something like that, you got my number. You know, call me, and if I don't know the answer to your question, I promise you I will say I don't know, but I will find out, you know, as far as that's concerned. <laughs> Somebody told me one time, they said, well, you went to seminary, so now you know everything. And I said, no. I said, I went to seminary, so now I know where to look for it. You know, I know how to find it, you know, from there. Uh, okay. Uh, well, I'm, I hope that you're enjoying this. I hope this, or maybe not enjoy. I hope you're, this has been informative to you uh, from there. Uh, and, uh, and if you ever want to pursue it further to learn more, you know, I've got some things that I'd be happy to loan to you uh, and that you can, you can read on your own. I, I've been trying to find, there is a movie about Mormonism that was made years ago. Uh, I mean, I'm talking a long time ago. That was probably one of the best things. It was produced by some former Mormons. And the movie's entitled Heavenly Deception. Uh, and that's a good description of what Mormonism is, is heavenly deception. Uh, just enough truth to make it seem real, you know, from there. Okay? And I, I hope, I'm still looking for it. I hope I'm going to be able to find it. You know, and I'd like to show it to you because it, it was an eye-opening for me. And, of course, now I'm talking about it. It was probably 30 years ago when I saw the movie uh, from there. Okay, well, let's pray then before we go. Y'all take care of yourself this week. We, we're going to get our first taste of winter. Uh, so keep your tootsies warm, you know, and, uh, over the next days. Look out for your neighbors and things of that nature and make sure everybody's taken care of. Father, we thank you so much for your word because, Lord, we know we have a genuine source of truth because you revealed yourself to us through your word. And I pray, Father, as we seek to know you more, as we seek to be better prepared to, to be able to share our faith with those that have been deceived because you told us that there would be other, there would be people coming. There would be some people who would preach to us another Jesus. And we know that these people are following the wrong direction. And so we want to be agents of change, agents of salvation in them, and so that we might glorify you through the things that we do. We love you, Father, and we ask this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Have a good week.